Hi, I am Dr. Sridhar Kalyana Sundaram. I am a consultant neonatologist. Welcome to my channel and thank you for your positive feedback and for subscribing and sharing the information. So this is the second video on oxygenation and I hope you watch the earlier one which gives us an overview of uh, the importance of getting adequate oxygen to the tissues and how the various uh, <coughs> deficiencies of oxygen and things impact the body. So in this video we are going to focus on what tools we have to measure oxygenation and uh, in the following video we'll be discussing on target oxygen saturation that we will use. So this will be a PowerPoint presentation and we will go through. What are the clinical tools to measure oxygenation? So we can have the partial pressure of oxygen this measures the oxygen dissolved in the plasma and as we discussed in the previous video this is a very small proportion and uh, arterial blood gas sample is usually used uh, to measure this PaO2 and uh, we can do the arterial measurement either from the umbilical uh, or radial posterior tibial cannula. The most accurate measurement of oxygenation is the PaO2 and it's a little difficult technically as it is uh, needing an invasive measure not all babies have an arterial line and we try to minimize interventions we try to reduce the number of days baby has an arterial line so even if they have it initially for blood pressure monitoring mainly very rare that we insert an arterial line just to monitor the PaO2 we would be monitoring uh, the blood pressure as well through that and obviously in the very tiny babies it reduces the need for pricking the baby frequently in the acute stages when they are very fragile so uh, it is invasive and it's also more expensive. Continuous monitoring is not routinely available and uh, intermittent measurements are used. So um, even though there is an option to connect your uh, uh, UAC or other arterial lines to a continuous uh, transducer, most of us use intermittent uh, blood gas measurements through the samples taken. For those of you who are wondering why the umbilical artery uh, the line curves down and then comes up. Uh, this is an anatomic representation. So this is the start of the umbilical cord and these uh, two are the umbilical arteries. So this is the catheter which is going in through one of the umbilical arteries. So you can see that uh, the umbilical artery actually joins this uh, gluteal artery, one of the branches of the internal iliac and then it goes through the aorta through the internal iliac. So the looping down is because of this that it doesn't go to the aorta directly. It goes through a branch of the internal iliac, enters the internal iliac and then curves up into the aorta. So uh, it's very important that we use this as a confirmation of whether it is in the umbilical artery or not. This also illustrates the different positions where an umbilical arterial line may be located. So we have the uh, celiac trunk, we have the uh, renal artery, we have the superior mesenteric and the inferior mesenteric vessel. So you have to keep it away from the origins of these vessels and uh, a high position you can go up to uh, T4, T5 even uh, before the internal mammary uh, branches start and then you have to keep it in a low position below these vessels. So either you target this area or you target this area and it's very important to avoid the origin of the renal vessels as you may have a clot originating in the tip which extends and causes problems. So uh, that is about partial pressure of oxygen and it's mostly used in the first uh, two three days and when we remove the umbilical arterial line you will not usually have the PaO2. In transcutaneous oxygen TCPO2 measures continuously via the transcutaneous sensor. The sensor needs to be heated to allow the measurement it acts by diffusion at the skin level and because it's heated it needs to be recited regularly to avoid burn. So every four hours or so you need to recite it. It's cumbersome to use and most units do not use this anymore as saturation is adequate in most situations. We do have it in our unit and we specifically use it for situations where we don't have an arterial line and we need PAO2 measurements. So it does help you to titrate without doing enough uh, more blood gases. And when we don't have an arterial line, the venous or a capillary uh, blood gas samples do not give you an adequate uh, representation of the PaO2. So you use it as a guide for the pH and the carbon dioxide, but you don't use the PaO2 anymore on those samples. So if you talk of a blood gas and PaO2, it has to be an arterial sample. <coughs> 
uh, capillary or a venous sample it's very difficult to deduce because the tissue uptake of oxygen as we discussed in the previous video varies uh, a lot so this is an image of a baby having transcutaneous oxygen and uh, pco2 measurements so you can see the oxygen below and the pco2 is above and it gets a good reflection of the trend so it's uh, theoretically a good tool but in practice because of the problems and the burns can be cumbersome we don't use it that frequently uh, but it's useful tool in some situations if you have it most important uh, monitoring uh, tool we use for oxygen is the oxygen saturation and as we discussed in the previous video it is a reflection of how much of the hemoglobin that is available is saturated with oxygen so the oxygen content also depends on the content of hemoglobin not just on the saturation of hemoglobin and both are important components so the saturation can be measured peripherally as we use on a saturation monitor when we call it as po2 or it can be measured on the blood gas where it is a measured sample uh, SaO2. Uh, it measures the proportion of RBC where hemoglobin is saturated with oxygen. Uh, because it depends on pulsatile flow, any situation which affects uh, tissue perfusion like shock and movement artifacts, hypothermia, uh, and because of the light being involved, light exposure may also affect reliability. There are recent advances like uh, we have in the Massimo monitor signal extraction technology and this helps to overcome some of this uh, quicker averaging time without affecting accuracy and uh, movement artifacts are reduced as well. So uh, this is a reflection of the monitor. Uh, the probe is placed on the foot of the baby or on the hands of the baby usually sometimes on the earlobe if the baby is big enough. Different sizes of the probes are available and uh, basically the pulse oximeter works uh, by having a red and infrared light emitted from a light emitter on one side and the detector is on the other side so uh, they have to be opposing each other and there shouldn't be uh, anything interfering with the measurement the movement artifacts can affect and uh, if there is external light it may affect so you may cover it up uh, with something opaque you need pulsatile flow so uh, the tips of the fingers are usually vascular unless you are hypotensive or cold so uh, the pulsatile flow is taken because the capillaries and veins also have hemoglobin uh, in them so it only takes up the extracts the pulsatile flow the sensors detect how much oxygen is in your blood by comparing how much red light and infrared light is absorbed by the blood depending on the amounts uh, of oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin the ratio is compared to the amount of red and infrared absorbed so it changes uh, depending on the algorithm so this is the algorithm that is used by the microprocessor for the same reason different companies have slightly variable uh, measurements for the same reading because their algorithms are slightly different and uh, it tells you uh, oxygenated hemoglobin deoxygenated hemoglobin how much of the red and infrared is coming back so again a reflection of the same so the factors we should consider is the fidelity of the monitor and the improvements that we have like the CT technology. Pulse averaging time is, uh, as I said, it picks up on the pulsatile flow. It doesn't read for every pulse beat. However, if there is a faster averaging time, the changes are more accurately reflected. The labor room, you may use a faster averaging time, so it picks up faster and it can be slower in other areas. So movement artifacts are reduced, the quick fluctuations that happen may reduce if you have a faster, slower averaging time. Uh, limb movement artifacts and temperature uh, and peripheral perfusion are also important issues to consider. When we talk of newborns, we also have to consider the pre and post ductal saturation. And obviously all of you are familiar with the critical congenital heart disease screening where we use the pre ductal measurement and a post-ductal measurement usually in the right upper limb for the pre-ductal and one of the lower limbs for the post-ductal and uh, this is uh, just to make sure that uh, we are not missing differences there uh, the ductus arteriosus is basically connecting the descending aorta with the left pulmonary artery and this uh, blue vessel is the ductus arteriosus and uh, this is joining obviously after the uh, left subclavian originates but sometimes it's almost at the same level so the left side 
left upper limb may or may not be pre preductal or postductal difficult to predict so we use the right upper limb as the preductal and the lower limbs as the postductal and uh, when there is physiologic pulmonary hypertension the uh, resistance to the blood flow in the lungs is high and so the shunt through the patent ductus arteriosus may be fluctuating from right to left for a period of time when the lung pressure is high like when the baby is crying or when there is a little hypoxia when the lung vessels may constrict or it may fluctuate to a more open pulmonary circulation and it becomes a left to right shunt in which case we won't have a pre and post ductal difference so the pda closes over the first two to three days and after this the pre post ductal saturation should not be different so we are specifically talking of uh, oxygenation to the brain which is from the preductal and so we prefer to titrate your oxygen depending on the preductal measurements rather than postductal so you may end up giving more oxygen unnecessarily to the baby if you have uh, postductal saturation recording so keep an eye on that if you need to keep increasing the FAO2 double check that there is no pulmonary hypertension and if there is pulmonary hypertension obviously you need to do an echo and make sure that baby doesn't need anything more to help so we do have alarm settings on the pulse oximeter and we should be careful about how we set the alarms and we should decide a target range to maintain it should not be too high to avoid hypoxia it should not be too low to avoid hypoxia so your uh, alarm settings are going to be a different range from your target saturation usually uh, the lower limit is three to four lower than your set uh, target range and the upper limit will be one or two higher than the set target range it should not be too narrow as well we don't want to keep our target range as alarm limits because then you may have repeated alarms and it might cause alarm fatigue it also causes uh, unnecessary changes sometimes you may increase fao2 for something which is very transient and which would come up anyway <coughs> a clear response plan should be communicated uh, to avoid excessive action so we can say that if the saturation drops below your alarm limit and stays that way for more than one to two minutes you may change unless it needs more urgent intervention you will obviously be looking at the baby as well so for example we aim to keep 90 to 95 percent as a target range we will be discussing that this in more detail in the next video as well the alarm limits can be set at 87 for the lower limit and 96 for the upper limit as we use in my unit and uh, this is as we discussed you don't want it too close to the target range if you don't want it too narrow as well but at the same time the upper limit should be always set for any baby needing oxygen so if your baby is having even a low level of oxygen you need to keep the upper limit on because you don't want hyperoxia uh, however the level to which hyperoxia will happen depends on how much oxygen you are giving so uh, if you have 0.25 oxygen you are less likely to cause very uh, high level of PaO2 compared to when you have 0.3 or 0.4 uh, in these cases it would be criminal not to have your upper limit set uh, and you need to titrate it down the moment it is more than 96 repeated education sessions and monitoring for nursing and physician teams is important for the same reason so we should be well aware we should keep discussing any colleagues notice that the saturation is more than 96 and someone is not acting when their favor to is higher you do feedback to them do educate them we will be discussing in the next video about how oxygen can be harmful to the baby and so that is important that we look at aspects to avoid oxygen toxicity as well so mainly reducing the risk of rop reducing the risk of chronic lung disease progressing and obviously hypoxia is also not good for the baby as repeated hypoxic episodes may affect your neurodevelopment so how does the saturation correlate with the partial pressure of oxygen so we have uh, many studies which have looked at this in a study of 98 consecutive infants born at less than 29 weeks uh, that compared the paired saturation and pao2 the mean partial pressure of oxygen at 85 percent saturation was 40 with a range of 29 to 51 and at 95 percent saturation the mean pao2 was 54 with a range uh, from 41 to 67 so uh, the alarm settings as we discussed will be around this range so we are fairly safe in most situations and as i said earlier the amount of fetal hemoglobin and adult hemoglobin will affect the saturation reading you get as well uh, in another prospective multi-center study of 122 neonates that compared 976 paired saturation and pao2 measurements the saturation values between 85 and 93 percent the mean pao2 was 56 millimeter mercury 
and approximately 87% of the PaO2 is between 40 and 80 millimeter mercury. So even with 93 saturation, a good number goes up to uh, 80 millimeter. And 9% were below 40 and 5% were greater than 80 even, even at 93%. When saturation was greater than 93%, the mean PaO2 goes to 100 plus, which you don't want. Uh, and approximately 60% of the PaO2 values were greater than 80 in these situations. So uh, it's very important that we monitor and titrate according to the needs. And when you say a target range of 90 to 95, you will have briefly hitting 95. But uh, as long as it's in that range, it should be reasonably okay. And as I said earlier, the PaO2 will not go excessively high if our FiO2 is not too high. And we discussed this earlier, the transfusions can affect this by changing the proportion of fetal hemoglobin where the shift to left happens and uh, adult hemoglobin uh, increases, there is a shift to right. So at a relatively same PaO2 level, uh, the saturation is higher if you have more fetal hemoglobin and in the same baby after a couple of transfusions, the saturation at a given PaO2 will be lower. So you have to account for that when you adjust your uh, target range. However, if you use a range which is reasonable, if it comes to the lower edge of the range after transfusions, you accept that. There is a higher risk of retinopathy of prematurity with multiple transfusions, and this is related to this hemoglobin binding factor, how easily it's released to the tissue. So the fluctuations that happen uh, leads to fluctuations in the vascular endothelial growth factor levels, and that leads to a higher risk of ROP. Uh, lastly, we will have a quick look at near infrared spectroscopy and how it works. So we discussed oxygen consumption in the tissue. So we have the oxygen in the arteri arterial system and then the oxygen extracted in the capillary level, and then the returning blood has lower level of oxygen. So oxygen consumption can be calculated as a function of the cardiac output and the arteriovenous difference. And uh, the resting VO2 is approximately 4.5 to 7 ml per kilo per minute during the first month after birth. The near infrared spectroscopy tries to measure this and you may have probes at different levels to see the differential consumption. You may have it at the limb level, you may have it in the abdomen to measure renal perfusion and you may use it over the brain. So uh, the oxygen extraction can be used as a sign if there is uh, sepsis, for example, there will be excessive tissue consumption and uh, hypotension doesn't allow adequate extraction. So if there is a uh, septic shock, for example, the blood goes through fast, it's a dilated system, so the extraction will be lower. And if it is a stagnating system where the need of blood flow is not happening or there is more time that it stays in the tissue, then you have uh, more extraction. So you can use these as a guide to uh, help you with hypotension management as an algorithm as well. So you use echocardiography as a guide, you can use near infrared spectroscopy as a guide as well to know how, how much brain perfusion is there. It's still not well established in clinical practice and not many units have near infrared available to them. And uh, it's a useful tool to monitor uh, treatment asphyxia and also to titrate your response to shock and hypotension. However, we still need to await uh, some more information, more training before we can apply it in clinical practice. So to summarize, pulse oximetry is the most important clinical tool to monitor oxygenation. So we should be well aware of the pros and cons, uh, the tips to use it appropriately. For example, if you're going to the labor room, it has been well established that if you connect the probe uh, first to the limb, you switch on the monitor and then you connect the uh, interface between them. So the probe and the monitor are connected after you have done both stages, it picks up quicker. And using some monitor with signal extraction uh, technology, for example, may be able to give you readings faster. We should uh, use a saturation as a guide and in most instances you don't need the arterial samples because nowadays we don't ventilate long term. We try to extubate at the earliest and we, as long as you understand that you are within a range, you understand what you are doing, you accept a little bit of physiologic uh, hypertension, pulmonary hypertension, you titrate through that phase. You don't overdo your ventilation, so overventilating also is harmful. It affects the oxygenation in the lungs as well. And uh, other tools like transcutaneous and uh, NIRS are not routinely used and uh, obviously you have selective set, uh, situations where it may help you.
so uh, as i said i'll be making the next video on oxygen toxicity and oxygen saturation targets so do subscribe do share with your colleagues and uh, if you are seeing this post on a facebook group where there is no sharing option because it's a private group you can always copy the link from youtube and share it on your whatsapp groups or other social groups that you have uh, to colleagues who might benefit and do turn on notifications uh, so you get informed when the next video is coming out i hope uh, this is helpful and uh, thank you for watching and uh, look forward to interacting more bye